My name is Ramesh Sardhavan and I'm a consultant urologist from Australia. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to share my musings on the topic of delirium and stroke in conjunction with World Delirium Day. As an outline, I'd like to start by defining delirium, then going on to an introduction in stroke, uh, addressing the specific issue of delirium and stroke, and then talk about whether delirium actually has an impact on stroke or rather stroke outcomes, and then speak about some future directions. Now, delirium is defined in the DSM-5 is of course a disturbance of attention and awareness. There's a change in cognition and this disturbance is one that occurs over a short period and tends to fluctuate. Obviously, there is very little reason for me to address the definition of delirium in this uh, sort of an assembly, but I think just for completion. More importantly, I'd like to talk about stroke. Now, stroke is the leading cause of disability and the most or second most common cause of death across the globe. In low and middle income countries, the incidence of stroke and resulting morbidity and mortality unfortunately on the increase. Um, and if we look at the proportion of ischemic versus hemorrhagic stroke globally, um, we're looking roughly at say 12% hemorrhagic 88% ischemic. This is true, I think, if you're looking at it as a sort of a generalization, but bear in mind that there is considerable change or difference depending on which part of the world you're in. In low and middle income countries, this proportion of hemorrhagic stroke is probably co closer to the 20 to 25% mark. What do these two conditions have in common? They share risk factors. And so, primary and secondary prevention are paramount. The good news is that in the last 25 years or so, there have been major advances in how we treat acute stroke. And this is based on a combination of rapid assessment, um, advanced imaging, and acute interventions. This map shows you roughly the burden of stroke in terms of morbidity and mortality. Uh, these are, of course, based on estimates, and this comes from uh, part of the Global Burden of Disease Network. The warm part of the spectrum, the reds, the oranges, and the browns, are where stroke hits hardest. And as you can see, this is mostly in the lower and middle income countries, as I said. In 2016, Again, as part of the global burden of disease, there was an important uh, publication that addressed risk factors for stroke. And what the authors basically concluded was that 90% of stroke is attributable to 10 modifiable risk factors. Now, if we would better manage these risk factors, we might prevent up to 75% of stroke worldwide. Bear in mind that aging, is the leading risk factor for stroke and most would say that that's not a modifiable risk factor but I guess it depends on how you look at it. The 10 modifiable risk factors that were addressed in the article that I spoke of, that's the reference there, were grouped as behavioral factors that included smoking, poor diet and low physical activity, metabolic factors that addressed conditions start, such as hypertension, um, obesity, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and a low glomerular filtration rate due to any cause. And then there were the environmental factors of air pollution and lead exposure. Now, the important thing to remember, of course, is that these are the same risk factors for heart disease, peripheral artery disease, and based on a growing body of evidence for dementia as well. Again, these risk factors are unfortunately more prevalent in low and middle income countries. Let's move on to acute stroke therapy. The mainstay of acute stroke therapy starting from 1995 was thrombolysis using alteplase. There is another agent which is now used, tenecteplase, but this is still something that is being sort of researched a little more. 
the analysis of the studies that have been published in the last 20 years demonstrates that alteplase definitely shows a benefit to patients with stroke if we look at the outcome at 60 to 90 days. The window for thrombolysis alone in patients who are not wake up strokes is 4.5 hours. What we know is that the earlier thrombolysis is given, the better the outcome. And this better, this better outcome is seen irrespective of age or severity of stroke. There is an increased risk of symptomatic ICH, but again, based on analysis of the first uh, thrombolysis trials in stroke, going on to what's done now, that increased risk of symptomatic ICH has dropped to about 3%. In 2014, um, to the excitement of everyone, there was the first positive trial of intra-arterial treatment for acute ischemic stroke using mechanical thrombectomy. This study was so um, important and of such significance that all other studies that were addressing the same question were stopped because of the results that were presented. One of those studies was one that was done here in Australia. The difference that this study sort of brought to the table was that selection of patients was based on perfusion imaging using CT scan. From there, we have now learned that mechanical thrombectomy is, <clears throat> excuse me, of benefit to patients up to 24 hours from the onset of symptoms, but again, based on imaging using CT perfusion and CT angio, which is to identify the clot causing the problem. In terms of pure thrombolysis alone, um, we now have evidence that in patients with wake-up strokes, there is a window of up to nine hours timed from between when the patient was last seen well to when they wake up. This is again based on imaging um, evidence using CT angio and CT perfusion. Needless to say, any patient who has thrombolysis, who has a large vessel occlusion, can benefit from mechanical thrombectomy up to 24 hours from onset. What does all of this mean? We have amazing ways of dealing with stroke patients now, but we have to ensure that all of the other things we do sort of keep pace. Delirium, in my opinion, is the weak link in the chain. So what are we going to be doing about this? Now, delirium in stroke is something that has grown amongst, in, or rather interest in delirium and stroke is something that has grown over the years. This is a meta-analysis um, and systematic review from 2012. The authors looked at 10 studies, including 2,000 odd patients. And what they showed was that patients who suffered delirium after a stroke had higher inpatient mortality, that mortality at 12 months was also increased, that these patients tended to have longer hospital stays and were more likely to be discharged to a nursing home or institution. Those of you familiar with delirium will know that this is true across the board. Fast forward to 2019, uh, an updated review <clears throat> was published. The first thing, of course, is that the number of papers that were included has now increased to 32 and the number of participants has gone from 2,000 to 6,700. So that in itself is, I think, a very good sign. What these authors concluded was that the overall risk or proportion of delirium and stroke was 25%. They have argued that the occurrence of delirium may vary according to the assessment method that was used, but not with the duration or timing of the assessment. Now, that I'll come to in a minute. The same authors who published the second review also looked at a prospective study and what did they find? In their proportion of, in their population of patients, rather the proportion of delirium that they um, 
came to was 25%. And they felt that age, the use of drug or alcohol, and severity of stroke were predictors of patients developing delirium in stroke. My colleagues and I in Malaysia looked at a similar thing. And what did we find? We found that the proportion of delirium was closer to one in eight or 12.9%. We found that patients who are above the age of 65, patients who had pre-existing dementia, those who had uh, tachy, which is total anterior circulation infarct, and a stroke severity score of more than 10 were more likely to develop delirium. In our proportion of patients, in our population rather of patients, lacuna stroke was not associated with delirium. Similar to the findings of the systematic review and meta-analysis published in 2012, our patients were significantly at higher risk of mortality and longer length of stay. What's the difference between what we found and what Terry Quinn and his group found? So to begin, we looked purely at ischemic strokes and we had a slightly smaller group of patients and definitely younger. And I think those were contributors to the fact that our proportion of delirium was somewhat lower. We found commonly that age, stroke severity, were independent <coughs> predictors of delirium. We also found that dementia and, as I said earlier, a total anterior circulation in fact, suggesting that cortical involvement is important. Lacuna, in fact, was a large proportion of our patients, about 60%, and we found no association. And as I said, we looked at outcomes where length of stay and mortality were definitely more significant in patients with delirium. Why is all of this important? Ladies and gentlemen, the population of the world is aging rapidly. This is something that we can't run from. And as I was saying to my trainees, the time has come where regardless of whether you're surgeon or physician, psychiatrist or anesthetist, all of us need to be geriatricians. So I've looked at stroke, I've looked at delirium in stroke, and now I'd like to move on to whether this actually has an impact. I've mapped it out in terms of the journey, more or less, of a patient who comes into the hospital with stroke, starting with recognition and assessment in the ED, going on to imaging and acute therapy, then on to allied health, then, then on to secondary prevention and intervention, going on to rehab, and then hopefully on to discharge. So, Delirium and stroke likely can lead to delayed presentation. It has an impact on the acute sort of intervention that we use, namely ECR. A patient with delirium, I propose, has reduced capacity to participate in allied health interventions. Of the secondary preventions, I've highlighted carotid endarterectomy because that is an active intervention that I will speak of. And we're looking at delayed rehabilitation. And as I said earlier, a discharge destination that is not home. Throughout the journey, of course, is the increased risk of mortality and morbidity, not just in terms of stroke, but as I said, with an eye on the effect of delirium and stroke. One of the things that um, we look for in ECR is, does the patient do uh, does the patient have the procedure rather under general anesthetic or conscious sedation? Now, this is something that is a fairly hot topic. This is a meta-analysis that was published fairly recently um, with the caveat that the procedure is done in a specialized unit with specialized neuroanesthesia. GA patients are assured of a better outcome at three months than patients having just conscious sedation. Ladies and gentlemen, the thing to remember, of course, is that what is the effect of GAA on a patient who is at risk already has delirium, food for thought. We move on to what's the best method of screening patients for delirium. And this is, again, a recent publication that um, 
assessed generally used delirium screening tools and found that the CAM or the confusion assessment method uh, by Sharon Inouye and her group is probably the best tool to use in looking at delirium in stroke. Now, again, this is probably a small group of patients, but food for thought. My group looked at whether there was evidence of a negative impact of delirium and allied health interventions. We initially started off looking at just stroke patients and found no publications. We then sort of cast a wider net looking at all conditions um, and found that there were only two sort of low quality publications which we still included. So there is a lack of data in this very major group. More recently, um, a publication looking at post-stroke cognitive impairment, uh, also a systematic review and meta-analysis. And what the authors have concluded is there is definitely a negative impact. Now, they've not specifically addressed delirium in this, but I think it was probably included in their, in, in their group of patients. The impact of delirium and carot carotid endarterectomy is again something to consider. As I said, this is a part of our active intervention in person who's had a stroke. If a person who's had a stroke has uh, ipsilateral carotid stenosis of more than 70%, we would recommend that they have carotid endarterectomy, preferably within two to three weeks, but giving up to three months for the procedure to, to be done. Now, this systematic review was not able to look just at carotid endarterectomy alone. Uh, it looked at vascular surgery. And as the authors pointed out, this is a fairly sort of broad terminology. In this group of patients, two studies included patients with carotid endarterectomy. It was a total of 51 patients who had uh, carotid endarterectomy. And the evidence would suggest that Again, we come to that sort of magic number of 25% who are affected. The results of the meta-analysis suggest that patients who've had previous stroke or history of neurological comorbidity were at higher risk. So again, no clear evidence that um, delirium would have a negative impact in terms of patients who've had a carotid endarterectomy, but definitely, again, food for thought. Now. Where do we go from here? Is there a means of us predicting delirium and stroke? There seems to be some evidence. This is a group from the Netherlands and they looked at various models and concluded that a model including age, severity of stroke, subtype of stroke, and the presence of an infection would help to identify patients who are at risk of delirium. Where then does that leave us? Now, what needs to happen moving into the future? I think that we need to be able to predict delirium and stroke and implement preventative strategies. I feel that there has to be a recognition of delirium early and diagnosis using established tools, and we have a few of those. The impact of delirium on allied health cannot be sort of swept aside. I think that there's definitely an impact that we need to look at, and we need to look at ways to circumvent this effect. From there on, there has to be a seamless flow onto rehabilitation. So ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, delirium is unfortunately underrecognized as a complication of stroke. The body of evidence suggests that about one in four patients with stroke will develop delirium and there are various sort of factors that come into play including age, pre-existing dementia, the severity of stroke and comorbid disease. We can look at predicting delirium and there's at least one predictive tool but sadly this is not widely used in clinical practice. This is something that needs to change. In conjunction with this we need to have better methods perhaps 
to predict delirium and we need to be able to act early to perhaps prevent it. The effect of delirium on allied health in assessments and participations in rehab must be minimized or voided. And we have to make sure that whatever it is we do for delirium and stroke keeps pace with the advances in acute stroke care. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Uh, please feel free to contact me or um, get in touch, in, whether on email or using my, my, my Twitter handle. Um, thank you again for your attention.